Machine learning is a core technology driving advances in artificial intelligence. This week, some of its earliest practitioners and many of the world's top AI researchers are in Long Beach, California, for the field's big annual gathering, the Neural Information Processing Systems NIPS conference. In all, some 7,700 people are to attend AI's version of high-tech's Flitzy South by Southwest conference, and the electronic device industry's even bigger annual SAY conference. It's NIP's 31st year in what originally drew just a few hundred participants, computer scientists, physicists, mathematicians and neuroscientists all interested in AI. Terence Sevnovsky, a computational neuroscientist at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies and president of the NIPS Foundation, spoke with Axios about growth in the field and what's next. How machine learning has grown since NIPS start in the 80s over that period what happened was a convergence of a number of different factors, one of them being the fact that computers got a million times faster. Back then we could only study little toy networks with a few hundred units. But now we can study networks with millions of units. The other thing was the training sets, you need to have examples of what it is you're trying to learn. The internet made it possible for us to get millions of training examples relatively easily, because there's so many images, abundant speech examples, and so forth, that you can download from the internet. Finally, there were breakthroughs along the way in the algorithms that we use to make them more efficient. We understood them a lot better in terms of something called regularization, which is how to keep the network from memorizing, you want it to generalize role of hardware by far right now at the most exciting part of the hardware development is special purpose digital chips that speed up and are able to enhance the learning that is to say the bottleneck right now for learning is the fact that you have to give it many examples basically it's applying the same simple operation over and over again what's happened is that nvidia and intel and a dozen other startup companies are designing special purpose learning chips Actually, Google already has one that's called TPU, Tensor Processing Unit, which they're using in the cloud because of the fact that it's much more efficient in terms of the energy use and the speed. Without it they would NT have been able to roll out services using deep learning, things like language translation. There's literally billions of dollars that are being invested right now in digital hardware. The problem though is that, of course, if you want to put it into a cell phone you have to make it very low power. The next generation will be even lower power chips using analog VLSI very larger scale integration. That's being driven by the applications of the technology. The cell phone market is huge, we're talking about billions of chips out there that can be put into cell phones. The coming challenge we can now put a million units with a billion connections and train it to do something. If you look in the brain, that's about 5 square millimeters of the cortex. What will eventually happen, and it is happening, is that we know that each part of the cortex is specialized for a different function. Each little patch, very tiny patch, has been dedicated to all these different functions, which we know are separate networks and to doing separate tasks, which is kind of a modular approach. If you look into the way the cortex works it's really interesting because all these areas are interconnected with each other. It's not like they're isolated from each other. Right, there are long-range, and there are short-range connections. The big challenge is the global organization of all of these, right now, modular networks that have been designed for one task each network. It'll happen. It's beginning to happen but it will require theoretical advances for how to organize all the information that is distributed over the entire cortex. This is a very exciting area in neuroscience right now because we have tools and techniques, like brain imaging, that we can actually see that happening, both during learning and also during memory consolidation during sleep. As we learn more about how the cortex organizes information globally, it should be possible to translate that into a global workplace built out of all of these chips that are being designed for all these special applications. There are a lot of other problems too, but it seems to me that the integration problem may be the key to general intelligence. That's something people like to talk about. They say, oh, you solved these little applications but you haven't figured out how to get much more flexible behavior that involves integrating all that information. My guess is that if we could figure out how the brain solves the global integration problem, we'll be on our way to understanding a little bit more about general intelligence. 
GoDeeper Nips is one of the AI hiring events of the year Business Insider. A new approach to image recognition is being presented by AI pioneer Jeff Hinton Science and News and a daydreaming AI MIT technology review. What they did the researchers cross-referenced US patent applications from 19,962,014 with federal income tax returns and used that data to trace inventors' life histories. All told, they looked at 1.2 million individuals. What they found children from lower-income families are 10 times less likely to file a patent than children from high-income families. White children are 3 times more likely to file a patent than black children. Children in low-income neighborhoods are less likely to grow up around academics or inventors. Without those role models, the researchers say they are less likely to enter such fields. Children are inspired by inventors who look like them. Girls were more likely to file patents if they grew up in an area with lots of female inventors but not if they grew up in an area with male inventors. What's happening? There are four different groups of serotypes of dengue virus. People who recover from infection with one type then immune to it. But some people can develop hemorrhagic fever if they are later infected with a different serotype. In the Philippines, about 200,000 people are infected with dengue each year, reports the NYT. Earlier this week, Sanofi Pasteur announced a long-term study of the vaccine found while it protected people who had already been infected with dengue. More cases of severe disease could occur following vaccination upon a subsequent dengue infection. Concerns about the Philippines vaccine program emerged early on. Anthony Leachon from PhilHealth told the NYT there was lingering uncertainty about the vaccine as medical experts awaited long-term clinical trial results. Evidence from manufacturers' trials shows that there may be a paradoxical increase in the incidence of severe dengue beginning a few years after children are vaccinated and possibly continuing for the rest of their lives, he said. The World Health Organization's position is that the dengue vaccine should only be administered in regions where there is a high burden of disease and to children over the age of nine. By then, most children in those areas will have already contracted the disease. What's next? The program is being suspended while health officials monitor the children, none of whom have currently developed a severe form of the disease according to the country's health secretary Francisco Duke III. Go deeper Axios Aaron Ross on the dengue virus complex relationship with the immune system. Why it's happening funding shortages. In 2016, the amount of money spent combating malaria decreased. Reports Maxman, a review of 75 malaria resurgences between 1930 and 2011 found that most upticks in the disease followed funding disruptions. Indoor residual spraying. The Economist reports some are blaming a decline in indoor residual spraying, which treats walls of houses with insecticide, for the increase. But evidence on the efficacy of indoor residual spraying is mixed. Ongoing humanitarian crises in countries like Sudan and Yemen make targeting malaria in those places more difficult, though the WHO reports apparent reductions in cases in some of those countries. Access to treatment is still less than it should be in many countries, reports the WHO. Drug resistance It's concerning that we're seeing more malaria cases, in part because resistance to some drugs is rapidly spreading in malaria in Southeast Asia. The region only accounts for 3% of malaria cases, reports Maxman, but if the resistant disease makes it to Africa deaths could dramatically increase. The bottom line if you ask me, the number and priority must be to ensure that people stop dying of a disease that is entirely curable, Alonso told Maxman. We only eat a small part of a scallop so we rarely see the shells, let alone their eyes. But they have up to a hundred laid out like a necklace of tiny, iridescent, blue-black pearls nestled in the tentacles that line the shell. How they work those eyes are relatively unique in the animal kingdom. In same way a radio telescope uses a large reflective dish to gather light and centers it on a sensor, scallop eyes have a mirror that focuses light on the retina. It's a small, compact visual system. It's hard to form an image in water with such a small eye, says study author Benjamin Palmer of the Weizmann Institute, who reported in the journal Science that the reflective film on scallop size is formed from stacks of semi-rectangular crystals of guanine, one of the four chemicals that make up DNA. It's amazing to look at the control these animals exert over the crystallization process, Palmer tells Axios. 
Normally, Guan Yin doesn't like to form square crystals. Attempts to build such crystals through traditional chemical means are clumsy, but the scallops accomplish it easily. By studying them, and other similar creatures, scientists might learn better ways to create efficient light-collecting molecules like these in the lab for materials science applications. What they did past research has shown the 50,000 children who were evacuated from Finland during World War II were more likely to experience mental illness than those who were not. To control for prior existing genetic tendencies towards mental illness, the researchers looked at the rates of hospitalization among the descendants of first cousins 3,000 children who were descended from evacuees, and over 90,000 who were descended from siblings who stayed. What they found daughters of women who were evacuated were four times more likely to be hospitalized for mental illness compared to the first cousins who stayed. This trend held true regardless of whether or not the mothers had been hospitalized for mental illness it was not true for male offspring or the descendants of men. Take note because the study is retrospective, it's impossible to capture all the possible variables impacting the children. And since the study looks at hospitalizations for mental illness, it may be underestimating the scope of the problem, since mental illnesses are often underreported, particularly in men. Still, a large sample size and strong associations help account for some of these challenges. The researchers weren't able to determine the cause